work that he's been doing. Um, he's actually doing some work out of Hatfield in the summertime, so I'm excited to see a little bit more about what he's doing. Um, Jen Rivers is an assistant professor with the Wildlife and Ecology Department in Forestry, Engineering, Resources, and Management at the College of Forestry at the University, uh, Oregon State University. Um, he received his uh, master's in biology from Kansas State, his PhD um, from the University of California in Santa Barbara. Um, he's kind of a generalist in animal ecologist, um, in, but one of his focuses is looking at uh, forest-dependent birds. Um, and so that's what I think he's going to talk to us about today. I'm going to hand it off to Jim. Thank you very much. <laughs> Clap at the beginning of the talk. That's great. A lot of anticipation. <laughs> So uh, thank you for uh, coming to this afternoon's seminar. Th thank you for the invite for um, setting this up. It's great to see a full room. It looks like there's a couple more seats if you're in the back and, and you want to grab a seat, that's OK. Um, I'm going to be talking to you today about a project that we've had uh, at Oregon State for the last several years focused on the marble merlet. And this is a bird, just out of curiosity, as a starting point, how many of you have, have seen a merlet out on the ocean? And how, OK, quite a few of you. How many of you have seen one in the forest? Okay, just a, just a handful. Okay, that would, that's to be expected. So what's, what's really interesting and unique about merlets is that they're a bird of two worlds. They're a, a seabird. They get all their food from the ocean, but they require specialized types of forests for um, nesting and for successful nesting and maintaining populations. And so as part of that, um, the history of the merlet and its study is, is really interesting. This is a bird that we have not known a lot about for a long time. And in fact, it was the last species in North America to have its nest formally described by scientists. And it wasn't until 1974 when then in California, um, what was tr then termed a tree surgeon was working in the top of a tree. And he just finished his lunch. And he was going back to work to trim some broken branches and looked down. And there was this, this organism looking back at him. He was just about to step on it on a branch. And he said, what is this? I've never seen this thing before. He'd worked in trees a long time and really had no idea what it was. He actually described it as a squished porcupine with a, with a bird bill, <laughs> if you can imagine that. But he had the foresight to say, this is something that's, that might be interesting and novel, and I should get in touch with the park superintendent, who in turn got in touch with a couple of biologists and together, they began to realize that this was actually a marble merlet nest. And it had been several hundred years, believe it or not, I'm, I'm overstating, 200 years, where there was uncertainty about where this bird nested. And it may not seem like a, a big controversy, but in orthological circles, the question was, does the merlet nest in a tree or does the merlet nest on the ground? And this had been going on for quite some time. And it wasn't until 1975 when we had the answer. So here's that that squished porcupine right here um, with the bird bill. That's the actual bird that was found in the tree. And that led to this publication, which again was the first um, description of the, the merlet's nest. And it was also, as I said, the, the, the last species of North America to have its nest described by scientists. So for a long time, merlets had been shrouded in, in controversy. And that's true to this day as well. If you've heard anything about merlets in the news, one of the things that you probably have heard about is the Elliott State Forest. The Elliott State Forest is a 85, 86,000 acre state forest down near Coos Bay, and it's really good habitat for merlets. And as you can see from this sign, um, this T in the, the the, that's actually a merlet in flight. And the reason for that is there's a lot of old, older forests on the Elliott where merlets are found. And in fact, right now, the College of Forestry is undergoing a process to determine whether or not taking over management of that forest is going to be a viable option um, for our college. So that's been in the news in the last several years. And then even more recently, you may have heard about the decision by o ODFNW Commission to uplist the merlet in February of 2018 to endangered. And then in June of 2018, they decided not to do that. And so they actually reversed that decision over the course of um, several months. And that's, that's brought a lot of controversy to merlets. Today, I want to leave the controversy behind because I think what we sometimes forget is what a unique species this bird is and what it can tell us about both forested systems but as well as marine habitats as well. So what I want to do in the time that I have is to answer three questions and walk you through the answers to each of them. The first is, why are merlets so different? This is a species that uses forests and we don't know of any other seabird in the world that uses it in the same way as merlets do. So we'll, we'll get you up to speed. If you don't know this, this bird, 
we'll do a little bit of natural history, um, Merlet 101, if you will, and give you a sense of what this um, species is all about. From there, we'll walk through the steps of how you actually go about finding merlet nests. Merlets are a listed species under the ESA, and that means that we're mandated to try and recover them, and that means we have to focus on um, increasing populations. And to do that, we have to understand factors that influence nesting success in this bird. It turns out it was the last species in North America to have its nest found because it's really, really challenging to find those nests. And so as part of our project, we're going out there and looking for them. So I think understanding the challenges against us is uh, really important and valuable to understand the story of the merlet. And then the last thing, of course, um, I want to share with you some of the insights that we've been able to pull together in the last several years. We started this project in 2016 doing some pilot work. And over the last three years, we've had a, a, an effort that has go, been going out every season trying to, to look for nests and try to understand more about this species. So with regards to that first question, why are merlets so peculiar? Well, in terms of their range, um, merlets aren't all that different from a lot of other seabirds. They're found along the west coast. You can find them in the Aleutians, up in Alaska, all the way down to Central California. Now here in the lower 48 states, they're, they're listed as threatened under the Endangered Species Act, so they have heightened protection and, and heightened interest in them from the conservation community. And they have similar protections in British Columbia as well. What we think we know about merlets is that they're long-lived. This is a bird that is um, relatively small. It's about the size of a robin, so only about 10 or 12 inches long. And it's, despite that, it's still a long-lived species. And what we know is that it lays a single egg per nesting attempt. And if you know anything about animals that are relatively long-lived and they don't have a lot of fecundity or they don't produce a lot of offspring in any, any one attempt, it means that their population change it can be very difficult to, to reverse those declines. And so that's one of the challenges of working with merlets is that they don't produce lots of offspring in any one year. Something else about merlets that's noteworthy is that they're generalists. They eat forage fish, but they also eat different types of invertebrates. But one of the, the things to keep in mind is that during the breeding season, they have to have forage fish to feed their offspring. When they go to the nest, they take a single fish, and they fly in into that nest site, and they deliver that prey item, and then they fly back to the ocean. And they don't regurgitate invertebrates or small fish. They need those large forage fish. And, and that will be an important point I come back to in a little bit. And then the last thing, just in terms of those of you who've seen a merlet in the forest can probably attest to this. This is a fast flying bird. It, it, its cruising speed is 60 to 70 miles an hour. It's been clocked on radar at 98 miles an hour. So not just somebody saying, oh, I think it went about 100 miles an hour over my head. Like it was actually clocked on radar at 100 miles an hour. They're brown, they're cryptic. They come in inland under low light conditions early in the morning and late in the evening. And they're doing their best to avoid being detected by predators and that includes humans as well. So just seeing if, if you're one of the people who are lucky enough to see a merlet in the forest, um, you can consider yourself lucky because that's not easy to do. So I mentioned earlier, merlets are a member of the auk family. And so like other members of this family, merlets are diving birds. They get all of their food from the ocean. So uh, most of these pictures are taken from the Oregon Coast Aquarium. You might think of puffins and murres and guillemots as auks. Merlets are, are right in there. They're very similar uh, in terms of their life history. They're all pursuit divers, which means they, they flap their wings underwater. They chase down prey items. And in so doing, um, they get all of their nutrients, all of their energy from the ocean. And when we think about th this group, the auks in general, we think about birds that are nesting on colonial rocks in huge aggregations. So this is a shot. Many of you are familiar with Yaquin Head and the seabird colony there. Um, these are common murre that are just squished in onto that rock. There's upwards of 60 or 70,000 individuals breeding uh, on that rock in any one year. And so that's one strategy is to, to get in, in a big, huge group um, for safety. Merlets have kind of taken a left turn in their evolutionary history, and they've decided we're not going to we're not going to nest in this large aggregation in the ocean. We're, we're going to spread out a little bit. And what they do is they move inland to older forests, and they nest in old growth forests as well as late successional forests as well. And what they're doing is they're dispersing across the landscape and they're looking for areas where they can rear their offspring in relative isolation from one another. So when we're looking for nests in the forest, you never come across a merlet nesting colony. That would be too easy. What they've decided to do instead is to, to spread out. And so you have a single pair at a nest site, and then you may have a, a pair in a, a, 
a, a nearby location, but you don't have large concentrations of the birds. And not only are they moving um, inland, they're moving large distances. We have records of merlet nests that are 40 miles inland from the coast here in Oregon. And in Washington, there's nests that are even further inland. So you, can you imagine flying 40 miles with a fish in your bill to drop it off and then flying 40 miles back and doing that two or three times a day? It, it doesn't, it's a little mind boggling when you think about it. So what are merlets looking for when they move into these, these areas? Well, they're looking for large limbs, horizontal limbs, that have a lot of moss on them. So this isn't a merlet nest, but this limb right here is indicative of what they're looking for. They want a nice substrate where they can lay that single egg. And unfortunately for us, merlets don't build a nest. So when we're out there looking for them, we don't look up in a tree and see sticks and things like that that you would for an owl or for um, a hawk nest. We don't actually see the nest at all because there, there really is no nest. There's just a substrate where the, the merlet's nesting. So they find one of these, these areas that they can access, and typically this nest site is, is much more densely covered with vegetation so that you can't really look into them very easily. They want to be hidden. They want to be cryptic. They don't want to be found by predators. Um, all, everything about their, their biology during the breeding season is to be cryptic and to hide from predators. So the merlet, as I mentioned, lays a single egg, and it takes a long time to incubate that egg, just about a month. And if that egg lasts that whole period and, and the nest doesn't fail, the parents have another four to six weeks of raising that offspring by bringing those single, single fish items in here. Now merlets are what some would call equal opportunity parents. Males share in the incubation duties. When we talk about male parental care in birds, oftentimes people chuckle because males are a bit of a, a, bit of a dud when it comes to um, parental care in birds. But that's not true with merlets. They, they share incubation duties. They incubate for 24 hours at a time. So one bird will start on a given morning, will incubate that egg all the way through to the next morning, and its mate comes and relieves it, and it goes to the ocean. They do this back and forth. And that's useful for us when we're trying to figure out whether an individual bird might be on a nest. The nestling period is one where um, there's very little brooding in the species. We have, um, I'll show you some video later, of a merlet being brooded, and it, it, it actually looks like it's uncomfortable. Um, they only do that for about 12 or 24 hours, and then once the, the chick is hatched and the parents are, are happy that it's, it's um, far enough along, they just start bringing food. And so much of the, the chick's time is spent on the nest completely isolated. There's no, no adults there. The parents come and feed it, and then at a predetermined time, this chick, this doesn't look like that chick that we saw earlier. This looks like almost like an adult. This chick literally pulls off all of the camouflage down on its body over the course of a 24-hour period, and then when it decides, it just flies off the nest and goes to the ocean. And it's, it's crazy to think about because it doesn't let its parents know that it's doing that. <laughs> so I can only imagine the parent comes with a fish and says, what happened here? Uh, were we successful or did somebody come in the middle of the night? They have no idea. And in fact, the parents, what we're finding is parents come back to that nest to check um, for a little while after that chick fledges. But, and I've got a, a video of this too. It, it just, it's amazing. The chick just says, now's the time, and off to the ocean. And as far as we know, there's no sort of interaction between that chick and its parents afterwards. The chick is completely on its own. It's on the ocean, and it doesn't, it doesn't um, reach up with them, catch up with them at all. From other areas, what we think is that corvids, members of the crow family, are the most important predators of merlet nests. And sellers jays and common ravens in particular are the species that we think have a pretty big impact on these birds. There's usually not enough merlets in an area for these birds to target them and look for all the merlet eggs. It's usually um, opportunistic foraging. A, a jay might be up in a canopy and suddenly it comes across a, a nest and um, attacks the egg or the, or the chick. We don't have good data on this, but that's one of the things that our, our project is interested in looking at is our, our crows uh, members of the crow family playing as big a role as we think they are in some of the other parts of their range. So this is a little bit of background on the birds. Um, why are we studying this bird here in Oregon? Well, it turns out that central Oregon's really good for, for merlet habitat. And in fact, the, net, the, the net high quality nesting habitat that we have in the state is, is more than three quarters of a million acres of habitat. So a big, huge area that um, is valuable for merlets. But prior to our study, there were only 29 active nests located in the state of Oregon. And those nests were found over almost a 30-year period. So if you're trying to manage close to a million acres of, of forest land 
with 30 nests, it's, there's just not enough information there. And what's, what's also important is that we don't have a good time series on what's going on now versus in the past. And we know that there's lots of things that have changed in terms of ocean conditions and climate change. So our project has really focused in on this piece of getting nesting data. So several years ago, we initiated the Oregon Marble Merlet Project. This is a large term, uh, a long-term large-scale study looking at merlets and trying to understand where merlets are nesting, how successful they are, and then what factors are influential on whether those nests are surviving. Because if we can understand whether um, jays or crows might be a key predator, there may be ways in which we can manage habitat to, um, to try and mitigate some of those factors. This is a big project. It's a state-funded project. And it comes to the College of Forestry through um, special appropriations. And it's, we have a very big team that we work with. Um, the, the photos that you see here, this is our full-time group. There's, um, currently, there's 10 of us right now. We also hire anywhere from 10 to 12 um, young professionals. Some are students. Some are just out of college who come out and work on the project every summer. And over the last several years, we, we did a tally. We've had 50 different um, young scientists who worked with us on this project. So a really, really big group. So um, our group encompasses myself and, and Matt Betts in the College of Forestry. Kim Nelson and Dan Roby are in um, Fish and Wildlife at OSU as well. So this is a, a cross-college piece. Um, some of our, our colleagues, Joe Northrup was a postdoc on the project. And um, he's continued his work. And then Sophie Garcia-Harris is uh, our current postdoc. So she's looking at some of our space use and movement. Um, Jen Guerrero, who's here today, is our program manager. And then we have three full-time faculty research assistants. Those faculty research assistants basically plan the field work. We finish in September, and they start planning for the next season, um, including our captures, which we'll talk about in just a little bit. So it's a huge project. It's a lot of effort. It's, someone asked me um, recently, why were you interested in being involved with this project? And I had to think about it, because it's, it is a challenging um, endeavor that we're undertaking, but there's so much to it, and there's so much that's new. And the potential to understand new things about Merlitz is uh, really what keeps a lot of us going. So it's, it's been a real fun time. Uh, we have at least another year or two on the project, perhaps longer. It just depends on, on what we're able to find in the, in the coming years. So that gives you a little bit of background on Merlitz. Certainly, there's, there's more out there. We'll talk um, about some key pieces as we go through. But that should give everyone kind of a on even ground as we, we move forward. The, the next thing I want to talk about is this, this Gordian knot of how do you go about finding these nests. It took ornithologists 200 years to do it, and we're supposed to do it multiple times every year, year after year. So how do you actually go about doing that and do it in a way that um, uh, you, can, you can do it successfully and not pull your hair out? Because it, it's easy to do that um, with some of the challenges that we've met. So when we were looking for nests, this is a bird that's nesting across um, the coast range. So just think of, a, think of the Oregon coast, go 40 miles inland and just draw a big rectangle. That's the area that we're supposed to be searching for nests. And what we wanted to do in this project is make sure that we were getting a representative sample, an unbiased sample, of where these birds were nesting. And pa past efforts have had to focus on particular areas to say, is a merlet nesting here, and can we find the nest? We didn't want to do that for our project. We wanted to make sure that we had birds that could be nesting anywhere, state lands, federal lands, private lands. And so to do that, we, we enacted the help of the Pacific Storm and uh, with Captain Yogi joining us. And what we do in the spring during May, we go out as many nights as we can out on the water. And our goal is to capture birds and tag them. And it turns out it's much easier to find nests when you tag birds. <laughs> Learned a lot on this project. And that's one of the take home messages for me. So unfortunately, we don't get out as often as we'd like. About 40% of the nights we get out, about 60% of them, it's, too, it's just too um, dangerous. The, the swell is too high, and we can't get out. But when we get out, we leave Newport around dusk. We head out. And on the back of the Pacific Storm, we have our one of our, our specialty um, tools for capturing merlets, this 14-foot zodiac. And when I was told, I'm not a seabird biologist by training, but when I was told, this is how we're going to capture birds in the open ocean conditions of the Oregon coast, I chuckled and said, you got to be kidding me. We're going to put people into that thing at night, and they're going to look for birds. And they said, yeah, don't worry about it. We do it all the time. I said, OK. All right, let's see how this goes. So here's us leaving Newport on a, on a pretty nice night in May. And we get out. We either go north or south, depending on weather conditions and how many birds we've been capturing. 
And believe it or not, that Zodiac, we can cram three six-foot-tall scientists into that boat, and they spend all night in that boat. I don't know how they do it. They're getting sprayed with water that's cold all night. Um, this, this is Daryl. Daryl sits in the front. He's the, our capture person. Um, his brother, whose name is Terrell. Oh <laughs> Talk to, talk to their parents about that one. Um, he's, he's our spotlighter, and he is in charge of finding those birds. And then Mike is our, um, our, uh, our boat operator. And together, uh, Daryl and Mike have more than 50 years capturing seabirds on the water. The, this is the world's expert. It's probably one of the most specialized um, ornithological careers in the world. There's not many people who do this. But they, they literally give up um, whatever they're doing in May. Mike comes up from California. Daryl comes back from wherever he is. Sometimes it's in Italy. And, um, swoops in on a plane and, and spends the month with us. And they spend all night in this boat. They literally risk their lives, to be completely honest. They're going out in the near shore environment, so within just a couple kilometers from the shore, and they're looking for birds at night. And that's an incredibly dangerous thing to do. In fact, the first time we offloaded this boat, we weren't working on the Pacific Storm. We were working on a crab boat. And I remember the, the first mate who, who launched the, the Zodiac as it drifted off into the dark looked at me and said, that just violated everything that I learned in school. You're never supposed to do that. And I said, they're trained professionals. At least that's what they tell me. So, so once we get out on the water where we're going to capture, we have these guys. These are our, our these, um, blue boxes. That's what we put the merlets in once we capture them. And believe it or not, that salmon net is enough to capture merlets. If you creep up on them quietly enough and you keep a spotlight on them, you can basically dip net them right out of the water. Their response when you get real close is to dive. So if you do it fast enough, they'll dive right into the net. And again, these guys are, are fantastic at doing this. So we get out on the water, we launch the Zodiac, and then they fade off into the, the black. And we keep in contact with them. We have um, radios. We, we can tell what they're finding. They radio back where they are, what they're doing. Um, Yogi follows them as we're going north or south along the coast. And then um, invariably, the radio crackles, and they say, we've got a bird. We're coming in. And at that point, what we've been doing on the on the, pack storm, the Pacific Storm is to get everything ready for that bird. And the reason for that is time is of the essence here. We don't want to stress these birds out. They're an endangered species, but we only have an hour to process the birds on our permit. So from the time that bird goes into the net, we hit a stopwatch, and we've got to have that bird off the boat and, and uh, free within 60 minutes. And so they come up alongside the boat. Mike, or uh, Daryl in the front, throws the, the, the line. Somebody captures it. We, hand down empty boxes, take the merlets, and in about 20 seconds they go back and they start searching for more, more birds. They do this all night long. And now, like I said, the clock is ticking. We want to get that bird off the boat, but we have a lot of, of work to do on each individual bird. So the first thing we do is we reach into that box, we pull the bird out, and we make a quick visual assessment of how healthy that bird is. We want to see a bird that looks like this. Its eye is wide open, its, its head is alert. It, if you can't see it in this picture, but it's struggling, it's trying to get away. That's the type of bird that we want. If we have any bird that seems like they're, they're not in good shape, we release them immediately. We don't want to ca cause them any more stress. It's only happened a couple of times. The, the great majority of the birds we capture are in good shape and that we can process them. And so we have a, a basically an a assembly line on the boat of people doing different measurements on the birds, and the bird gets passed from one group to, to the next. The first group goes through and takes morphological measurements on the bird. They look at whether or not the bird has a brood patch. That's the, the vascularized area on the stomach that, where feathers are lost during incubation. If you have chickens, you, you know that they have brood patches as well. And that gives us a sense of whether the bird might have an egg and might be breeding. Uh, we don't know whether this is a male or female. Uh, they're sexually monomorphic. The birds know, but we don't know until we go and take a blood sample and actually evaluate that. So that's one of the challenges of working with this bird. We can't say, oh, we're only going to target males or females for, for um, for putting on tracking tags. We also put on a unique, this bird doesn't have it yet, but a unique um, numbered band so that if anyone ever finds that bird again, dead or alive, we know where it was initially banded and how long it lived. And so all of our birds get a, get a band. We try and get as much information from each bird as we can. And one of the things that we can get is um, an idea of what the diet has been over the short term um, immediately prior to capture. So this is John Dockenhouse. Um, this night he was playing the role of fecal engineer. And he is reaching into that box and he's getting out poop from merlets. We can put that into a sequencer and we can actually figure out what the bird's been eating just based on the genetic material and its, and its fecal material. So we do that. 
we take the bird, as we're looking it over, we take blood samples. Blood, as I said earlier, allows us to tell us whether it's a male or a female. We get information on stress hormones, on white blood cells. Uh, it's basically a battery of tests that we can have to understand how good the bird is um, in terms of its health. And then if the bird is of sufficient size, we put on a tracking tag. This is a, a VHF tracking tag, so it gives off a constant um, pinging sound. You can almost think about it like a, um, one of those old-time submarine movies, like the Hunt for Red October, where there's this ping, ping. That's what this, this tag does in the very high frequency range, so we can't hear it, the birds can't hear it, but we have receivers that can pick it up. That tag lasts for about 90 days for each individual, and each tag is uniquely different in terms of its frequency. So that allows us to scan through a whole bunch of different birds and look for them at different points along the coast. And then once we have that on, the bird's free to go. And we've been able to get this down to about 35 minutes on average um, over the last couple of years. So we're, we're quite, a, quite a bit under that 60-minute um, mark. And, and that is the easy part, capturing and tagging the bird. The hard part is figuring out where it's going because, as I mentioned earlier, there's a huge track of forest that we are looking for the bird in. So the first step in that process is to have uh, a small army of field technicians who are working along the coast at the same time we have birds tagged. And what they're doing is they're going from location to location along a 140 kilometer stretch of coast looking for those birds. And if you've ever been out there in the summertime, and some of you have because you've already mentioned this to me, and you see someone out there that looks like they're looking for aliens um, scanning, the first question, don't ask them if they're looking for whales. Um, they get that question all the time. Um, and in fact, they made a t-shirt said, we're not looking for whales, just so people, <laughs> so people understood that. Um, and you can't see it very well here, but this, um, this antenna is pointed due west. And so we're running through all of the different tags that we have at this particular date, at this particular time. And we get a signature of who's here. And then we do that at all of those stops. We've got 45 stops along the coast. And we do that all throughout the season. So we, we get a sense of where birds are moving and how long they're spending um, time in different locations. But what we're really listening for, though, is that pattern I mentioned earlier, where there's a bird that's on the ocean one day, and then it's missing the next. And we can't find it in that whole 140-kilometer stretch. And then it's there the third day, and it's missing the fourth day. And when we get that pattern, that suggests that bird is going inland to incubate. It's on the nest for a day, and then it's coming back to, to feed. And when that happens, um, we have a fixed-wing aircraft on um, call. And we put our, our technician up in the aircraft and say, your job is to go find that bird in the forest. And it sounds like a daunting um, endeavor, but with the telemetry um, that we're using, if you get up high enough, you can actually get that signal from, from quite a ways away. So um, in some cases, five kilometers, some cases, 10 or even 15. So um, it only takes a couple of hours usually to, to know where that bird is. And this is a fixed wing aircraft. It's a, a twin engine, so it's going relatively fast. And we can't get a, a precise location on where that tag is. So they get in the plane. This is not for folks who get, get <laughs> some of you are shaking your head going, oh, it's not for me. It's not for me either. Uh, but we go around that site, take a GPS point, And at that, at that point, the plane is done for that bird. It's, it's basically located at that nest site. The next step is for our ground crew, who is out on the coast looking for the birds in the ocean, to go inland and start looking for that bird in the forest. And we can use a combination of techniques to narrow down to where that location is. We get in there from different angles, and then we kind of all come at it, several of us at once, looking for that signal. And if you've ever done anything with radio telemetry, you know that there's something called bounce, which you can just think of it as interference. And so instead of looking for um, a signal that is always is, is in a position where you can always hear it, what happens is that signal bounces off of trees, comes down to the ground, and bounces all around. So you can't, it's like someone standing talking to you in an echo chamber, and you can't really be sure where they are because you're hearing it from all sides. So the best that we can do is usually get it down to a couple of potential nest trees. We can say that this is a tree that could have a nest in. We can exclude the other ones. And then at that point, the next step is to go out and do dawn nest surveys. A dawn nest survey is where we go out early in the morning, we usually get up Depends where you're staying, but sometimes it's an hour's drive to get in. So you're getting up at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. Drive to this site, hike all the way down in. And what you're looking to do is to find an open patch of sky right adjacent to one of these big trees where we think the bird might be. And when you do that, it actually looks a little bit more like this. 
And when you're out there doing these surveys, it's early in the morning, you're really excited about seeing birds and you're looking up, you have to do this for about 45 minutes. And the challenge is that the birds come in 60 to 70 miles per hour. They don't call, they don't let you know they're coming. We do have some information that either the, the tag bird is coming so we can hear that on the radio and you hear a beeping that's getting louder and louder, but it's coming very quickly at you. Or you hear a beeping and then the beeping's gone and the bird is left. And so you know if the bird is on the nest, it's, it's leaving. But your mind plays tricks on you when you're in the woods this early in the morning. So you look up and you see something, you say, I think there's something there. And then you realize it's a mosquito. So okay, that's, that's not a bird. And it's you, this is heightened sense of, of I think there's going to be a merlin here. Usually it takes us three or four mornings to do that. You can imagine it takes three or four people to do that. So that's why we have such a big crew. And if all goes well, we narrow it down to one particular tree. And then we're in a position to put up a video camera at the nest. And I'll show you how these video cameras um, work in just a little bit. Um, we work with a canopy ecologist named Brett Loveless. You'll see his, his name in a number of these photos. Brett has taken some fantastic shots of merlets on the nest. Um, Brett climbs up this adjacent tree. We don't want to bother the bird while it's nesting. So he gets up in a tree where he thinks he has a good view of that nest. He puts in this video camera and it has an incredible zoom. I'll show you how good it is. And he brings it in right on that bird. And these are expensive cameras. I was looking at this photo recently and realizing that these cameras are thousands and thousands of dollars. And we put them on a tree with about $3 worth of zip ties. <laughs> but it works really well. And, and we found that that's the best thing. And no, you know, no sort of fancy things. The camera is hardwired down to the ground. And we have a hard drive that's filming 24-7. We do this at night. It's got infrared um, abilities. And then it's got this big, blue, heavy camera battery. It's about 35 pounds. So our crew members have to replace that every three days. And by the end of the season, you should see these technicians. They are in the best shape of their life. And they say, this is great. And I want to work on this project year-round. And the system that we have is, um, allows us to, to zoom in and, and get different shots with a little um, uh, Bluetooth so it's, it's a really nice setup. It's not designed for Merlots. It's designed for security cameras, but we've been able to, to, um, to make it work for our, our system. So in the time that I have left, what I want to do is share some of the insights that we've had. We've been working on this project in detail for, for three years now. And you would think we'd have a lot of data, but you guys know enough that when you work with Merlots, data are hard to come by. So we don't have as much as we'd like, but there, we are learning quite a few things about the birds that we didn't know, even though we've, we're, we're still a ways from, from drawing complete conclusions. So in 2017, this was the first year that we had this large-scale um, tracking effort that we, we went out and undertook. We caught birds. Um, we went out of Newport. We caught birds all the way down to Walport and up to Lincoln City. In total, we caught 76 birds. 61 of them were big enough um, and sufficient to, sufficient size for us to tag. So we were really excited about this. Other studies had not worked in open ocean conditions like we have here in Oregon. They'd worked in protected bays in Alaska, British Columbia, California. So we, were, we weren't even sure how well we'd do it just capturing birds. But it turns out um, we did a really great job. And we sat around and said, this is fantastic. Just wait for these nests to roll in. And we waited, and we waited, and we waited, and we waited. And we started to get the sense that something was off and that we were not going to have the season that we thought. And in fact, 2017 um, was a season of heartburn and cardiac palpitations for many of us on the team because we just outlaid a lot of effort, a lot of resources, and we're supposed to find nests. And it turns out none of our birds nested. <laughs> so what do you do with, this, with a goose egg when you're supposed to have lots of merlin eggs? None of our tag birds nested. And, and this was unprecedented. There's been other studies who've tried a few, tagging a few birds and haven't had nests found, but no one has gone to the extent that we have to tag lots and lots of birds and have none of them nest. And so we started saying, is it something that we we're doing? We went back, we looked at all of our procedures. We're, we're using the same procedures as people who tag merlets in Alaska, California, British Columbia, all the places I just mentioned. In fact, we had the person who designed the tag come out on the boat and train our group. So we knew it wasn't the tag, but we started wondering what was going on. Not only did the birds decide not to nest in our study area, they decided to disperse over a huge distance. Some individuals moving more than 560 kilometers. So our tagging area is in the center of this square. On a, and you can see each of those yellow dots is one bird on one day. And the whole season with all the birds and all the days is combined into one map. 
So what this shows us is that birds went as far north as Cape Flattery in Washington and, and as far south as, uh, almost as far south as San Francisco Bay. This is not what we were expecting. We were expecting our tag birds were going to stay in this general location. They were going to breed. So there's something about the conditions for 2017. And those of you who are um, in the marine, um, study marine systems, you know exactly what happened. Um, and I'll get to it in just a minute. Um, but this was an unexpected finding, and it's a really important finding when we talk about Merlet population estimates, because you can see on this, on this figure there are five different zones that I've outlined. Those are so, zones where Merlet population surveys are conducted. And those, those survey-specific zones are used to generate estimates of population sizes for Merlets. In turn, those are used for listing decisions. In the past, all of those zones have been done in the same year, all, all those surveys conducted at once. But because of budget cuts, the zones aren't always surveyed in the same year. So when we did our work in 2017, there was no, there was no work being conducted in zone three, but in zone two and four, it was. So there's the potential for our birds that we thought were residents in our zone to be moving into those other zones and potentially influencing those population estimates. Now, we don't know if other birds are, are coming into um, central Oregon. We don't know if it's kind of a, a zero sum or we don't know if there's movements one way or another. So this was, this was a pretty big finding. It was certainly nothing that we expected. We weren't planning on flying to San Francisco. Um, that was not in our, um, our, wasn't in our budget, but we made it in our budget because that's, that's what we had to start, start doing. Joe? Yes? How many of the birds left and then came back to the general area where they were tagged, or back into zones three, let's say? A few birds did. Only a few? A few birds did, um, in part because and I'll show this on a... Uh, but you got 90 days of, of tag life. So. Right. We have 90 days of tag life, but we didn't search all these areas with equal effort. In fact, we only got to California a few times. And so we have kind of partial information about what's down there. Um, and that's... I'll bring that point up again when we look at this figure. Uh, we Birds certainly had the opportunity to come back, but there were very few that we actually saw moving back into that zone. I think the numbers for this year worked up to be two-thirds of the birds left and and went out to um, either California or Washington. Thanks. But the bigger question, though, is why, what was driving this? What's the mechanism behind this? And if, as I mentioned earlier, if any of you have been following ocean conditions, you know that in 2017, there were anomalous ocean conditions. Upwelling was not um, at what we would anticipate. And it certainly wasn't something that kind of kick-started the, um, the, the trophic web off the coast. So without upwelling, we don't have a lot of those um, cold water copepods coming up and having good forage fish that, as we mentioned earlier, are really critical for merlets to be able to feed. So if merlets don't have forage fish, they're not going to initiate nesting. And in fact, if you look at some of the, um, some of the um, numbers that came out of um, some surveys that were conducted for some of the forage fish that we know merlets eat, they were historically low. And it wasn't just merlets that were having um, issues. There were other um, seabird populations that didn't seem to be doing well in terms of um, during the summer. So this is what we want to see during the summer, merlet coming in with a sand lance, a nice big um, food item. That was not what was going on. We think ocean conditions were driving this, um, this change. And that's been our working hypothesis since, since then. Now, one of the interesting things to note, and I just mentioned this, is that um, ocean conditions were poor in 2017. They've gotten better in the last two years, but we still see a subset of our birds are moving down to Washington, or moving down to California and moving up to Washington. And keep in mind that the effort here is different. We have a lot more flights in this first year, better resolution on where those birds are in time. Um, and we took fewer flights in the last two years because we actually had birds that were nesting, and so we weren't able to put that effort into it. But what this tells us is that there are for whatever reason, birds that always are moving, uh, at least in the three years we studied, all, always moving out of that survey zone. We don't know if these are young birds that are going out and finding the world. Uh, we know that merlets don't breed for the first two years of their life. So this may be juvenile birds they are exploring, figuring out where to go. Or it may be um, birds that just decide not to breed in a given year and go to where the food is. And we think that's what was happening in 2017. There were little clusters of um, birds in some areas like um, uh, Cape Blanco, where there was some, some cold water. And that's one of the things that we're looking at, is to see if birds are tracking where that um, sea surface temperature is. So interestingly, this movement is there. Again, we don't know if this is something that 
is going on at all points along the coast and all the birds are mixing or if it's coming from central Oregon where we have particularly good habitat. So the good news is, and I already, I already um, spoiled this by telling you, the good news is that we actually did find birds that were nesting in the last two seasons. So in 2018, we had eight active nests and we had four more nests in 2019. About 40% um, of those nests were successful and you can see them in the, uh, the white triangles and the white circles. The nests that failed are in red. And interestingly enough, uh, a couple of these a couple of these nests failed before we could actually get a, a camera on them. Uh, we know that the bird is nesting when we have that on-off pattern. That's, that's established as nesting in the, in the Merlet literature. But if we don't get there in time to locate that nest and get a camera, we don't know why that nest failed. And so we had a couple nests that we know failed, but we don't know what caused it. But of the nests that we did get video cameras of, we haven't had evidence of corvids, members of the crow family, um, causing nest failure. So that's kind of an interesting result. And it parallels some work that's found um, the same thing in Washington, where corvids don't seem to be um, driving the system as much as we thought they were based on, on California. Um, one thing to note is that all of these nests were found on the Sayuslaw National Forest south of Newport. Uh, if you know anything about that forest, it's got a lot of good habitat for merlets. And so uh, it's, it's not surprising that even though we were capturing um, birds north of Newport, uh, we were still getting a lot of those birds going inland. And if you squint really hard at this, um, or even if you squint really hard at this, I don't think there's any sort of pattern with nests being more likely to fail if you're further from the ocean. Um, that's one of the things that we'll look at as we accumulate more nests through time. But um, we have nests that were close to the ocean that, that failed and some that were far that were successful. So the last few slides, what I want to do, because this bird is um, not well documented in terms of its nesting, there aren't a lot of good pictures out there of merlets on the nest. And our, as I mentioned earlier, our canopy ecologist, Brett Loveless, was able um, to get some fantastic shots. He went up and took a picture from the first nest, he didn't like them, and he said, I'm going to get a new camera. Mm -hmm. And we said, great. And then he turned around and he started taking these National Geographic level photos. So I want that camera. Um, but you probably can't see the merlet in this picture. It's hiding right here. And if you zoom in on that, this is what that bird looks like. And th this is about what merlet um, incubation video looks like. This is a still shot, but that's what they do. They just sit there. <laughs> and they don't move. And if you don't believe me, I'll show you a video of it. Um, what you can see is this small, it looks like a twig. Uh, that's one of our tracking tags on the bird. So this is one of the birds that we caught on the boat, put on the t tag, and then ultimately followed it back to the nest. And this was, um, I think all these shots are from uh, 2018, so, so uh, that first year of nesting. So this nest was in a uh, hemlock. Most of our, our nests had been in a, Doug a big Douglas fir. Uh, this is a different perspective. If you didn't know that this was a merlet, in fact, if I zoom the camera out, you wouldn't even be able to see this. You would think it's just a little stob um, sticking off this branch. They are almost motionless when they're when they're on that nest. And again, what they want they, what they want to do is blend in and not draw any attention to them, so they don't move around much on that nest at all. One of the things that was really interesting um, from one of our nests is that we found a nest in a big leaf maple, and this is only the second record of a big leaf maple having a merlet nest um, that that we know of. Uh, that other nest was found in the 50s in British Columbia. And if I describe to you what merlets like for nest, nesting substrates, and so they like really big horizontal limbs with lots of moss, with a lot of overhead cover, and a little spot where they can fly into, you'd say, of course, that's probably in a Douglas fir, right? Well, this limb has everything that that bird would need. And so sure enough, our technicians went out and said, we think it's in a big leaf maple. And we said, are you sure? Does it we wouldn't expect it to be in there. They said, we think it's in there. I said, go out and do another dawn survey just to be sure. And I said, yeah, we think it's there. And sure enough, there's a merlet sitting on the nest right there. And it was a good reminder to me that this is why we're radio tagging these birds. You know, if we had just been looking for nests, we would never have spent the time to look in a big leaf maple. We would have been focused on Douglas fir because that's where they always are. Now, we don't think that this is a, a common tree that this bird uses, but it still helps us understand that um, they use broader habitats than what we may have appreciated otherwise, and that going to all the trouble of tagging those birds on the ocean is actually a good thing. What's the height of that nest? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, I'd say under 100 feet. Yeah, it was one of our lower ones. Um, it was impossible to, to locate, and in fact, one thing I, I, I don't have time to go into today is we've, we've tried alternative 
approaches to finding nests, we've been flying drones with thermal cameras. We couldn't find this bird on that nest with a thermal camera. It was so well hidden. Not only that, but these patches of, of sunlight look like merlets. And the way that we find, the, find this nest, I should have put this in there. Um, we have someone on the ground who has a, literally has a small um, iPad. And in real time, he's trying to pick out merlet patches um, versus sunlight patches. And it just doesn't work. And we don't have enough time. So we've tried drones. Um, but I was, I was skeptical about this nest until we actually got this photo. And I said, OK, I guess I got I to gotta believe it now. So the last few slides here are videos. This is to give you a sense of what the, um, the zoom camera is. This is that first nest we looked at in the, in the hemlock. So see if you can see the merlet sitting on the nest here. And then have a look. Now I blinked just there. <laughs> It's hard to know when this video stops. <laughs> I think it just stopped. And we actually have our, our student crew going through and looking at these videos of incubation. And it's, it's tough for them to get through. Let's just put it that way. But they're, but they're doing a great job. And if you're watching this, we appreciate all your efforts. So that's um, egg incubation behavior. I mentioned the, the, the incubation exchange. Oh, question. Sorry. Um, do you have any reactions? The, the drone use, we did not detect much of a reaction from the adults. And I think that the reason for that is that this is a bird that's trying to hide from <laughs> potential predators. And you find that in lots of birds. Um, song sparrows, for example, will sit tight, and you can walk right by their nest without them flushing. The, we tried it with one adult that was incubating and didn't seem to have much of an issue. We tried it with a, a chick, and the chick was getting a little agitated, so we actually stopped. Um, so our sense was that we could probably use it during incubation, but not during the nesting stage. So to find these nests, just as a reminder, we have to see the birds come and go into those nest trees. And I don't know if I mentioned this, but that exchange lasts about 15 to 20 seconds. So one bird comes in and the other bird comes out. And you can see it in real time. This is at about 5.30 in the morning. This bird's on the nest, blinking. Its partner comes in. And you can imagine this bird's been fasting for 24 hours, so it's not really interested in catching up on the news. <laughs> Takes a quick peek, and then <laughs> it's off to the ocean. So that time frame, that 20 seconds, that's what you have to find the bird and see it and figure out which part of the tree it's coming in. Incredibly challenging to do. And that's where, when I first heard that, I said, let's get drones involved. This will solve everything. No, they don't, they don't work like we would hope they would at the current time. Um, Brooding is an uncommon behavior. As I said, the, the parents don't spend much time at the nest once the chick hatches, just usually less than a day. And you can almost get the sense that this bird doesn't feel comfortable sitting on this chick, keeping it warm. Chick kind of wants to be seen. And the parent <laughs> says, you were an egg for the last four weeks. What happened here? Um, this video is a very short um, segment of a longer piece of a parent coming to the nest with, with this fish. This is that still shot that I showed earlier with the sand lance. The parents come and they land, and they can land and sit still for 20, 30, sometimes even 40 minutes. They don't move. And if you're trying to avoid causing um, attention at your nest, that's what you would do. You'd land and you just stay still. Of course, as, as you'll see, this bird is sitting there still. The chick is begging and making all kinds of noise, making a bit of a ruckus. And so this is just the very tail end. The parent decides, OK, this is your, your fish to deal with now. They don't help them with this at all. And the parent's job is done. One last look, and then back to the ocean. Now the chick has the job of swallowing this prey item whole. And you'll see that in just a moment. And there it sits. And what we're finding is that there are, it's variable in terms of how many visits come per day, but oftentimes it's only two or three visits. So that, that 
bird may only have three fish, four fish a day to eat, which is, is kind of mind-blowing that it's sitting there um, just basically processing those fish all day. So that this was uh, 11 o'clock in the morning. Most of the visits, as I, I mentioned, are early in the day or late in the day. So that, this 11 o'clock feeding is a little bit um, a little bit different than what we'd expect. Later that day, about 4 o'clock, this is what we saw on the video. Birds sitting there quietly. And out of the blue. So anyone, anyone who's a birder know what that was? Red-tailed hawk. So what is a red-tailed hawk doing depredating a merlet nest? Because red-tailed hawks are birds of open country. Right? We would expect that a Cooper's hawk or one of these forest accipiters, like a goshawk, we don't know why. That's not a question that you need to answer. It's, it's one that we, we don't have an answer to either. So um, this is a, the first record of a red-tailed hawk depredating a merlet nest, and it has never been on a, kind of the list of potential nest predators. So again, not a big sample of nests, but we're finding that they're using trees that we didn't expect, and they're having predators that we didn't expect as well. I don't want to leave you on that low note. <laughs> I've, done, I've given this talk and I've left on the no, low note. It just doesn't go very well. So I figured I'd, I'd leave on a high note and show you what a successful chick leaving the nest is. So this is also early in the morning. This is about 6.30. This is um, early September 2018, the last nest of our first season where we had nests. And you can see this chick just has has some sort of energy, it's not sure what's going on. And then suddenly, and, that, and that's it, and that, that's over. So, we talked about a lot of different things today. What I want you to take home is that we've been working on this project for a while, and although on the, from the outside, finding 12 nests doesn't seem like a lot, we've actually been increasing our understanding of Merlis by quite a bit. We've, we've increased that number by 40% over the first two years. But we're also finding out a lot of things about Merlis that either we, we suspected or we didn't have a good handle on. One of which is that they are using more species than we would have assumed from the beginning. They have a, a more diverse array of predators. And again, we don't know about um, members of the crow family, how important they are. They could have caused the, the failure of a couple of our nests that we didn't get to with a video camera, but we haven't documented them on the video, which I think is, is important to, to note. We also have, um, it's really jumped out how important ocean conditions are for nesting. We knew this from the beginning, but not until 2017 when we had none of those birds breed did we really kind of step back and say, wow, this is, this is something that we have to tackle. And we've actually taken steps to do that. Um, we had a, a, a forage fish workshop to, to start the conversation about that. Um, Greg and Jennifer and others um, gave presentations at that. And we're starting to try to think about what can we do on the marine side of things to to better understand um, food resources for merlets during the breeding season, which are also food resources for lots of other predators as well. And that's that's one of the things, our charge has always been to find nests, understand what's going on in the forest. I'm in the College of Forestry, and that's why that comes in. But we have to we have to make sure that we see both sides of that, um, that piece. And then the last piece as well is um, that within season movement. This has been suspected by others, but no one's been able to document that, yes, we tagged a bird here and it moved down. And one thing that's, that I didn't mention is that one of those birds that went up to Washington in 2017, we recaptured it in 2019 and it ended up breeding in Central Oregon. So what that suggests is either it was a young bird that was just going out and finding its way, or it was a bird that is a resident and just decided to go up to Washington because of the conditions. We don't know, we can't age these birds, unfortunately, but it does give us the indication that if we're capturing birds, there may be a good chance that they're breeding in that area in the future. So lots of people to thank here. As I mentioned, um, 50 technicians. The first year we had 40 different people on the capture boat. So lots of folks here who uh, don't have their name up here, but um, we're, we're incredibly appreciative to all of the efforts. It's a huge um, challenge to do this project and having, um, having so many people um, put their blood, sweat, and tears into it has, has made it a success um, to date. So with that, I want to thank you for your time and for coming to this afternoon's seminar. And, um, we have time for questions. If we have time for questions, I'm happy to take them. It looks like we do. So, yes. Well, there's a couple of different um, definitions. 
of old growth, and it usually goes back to not only the how old a forest is, but how complex it is and how much um, um, structure it has within it. So we Merlets can use forests that are that are not old growth that are considered late successional. So there isn't when we're when we're talking about this for Merlets, I think it's important to think about the structure and what's there. And in <coughs> fact, there there is one nest that was found in a relatively young stand because it had a witch's broom that had a structural um, component that was okay for nesting, and that's where a nest was found. Um, that's not to say that we're going to find Merlets in those young stands. So. To answer your question, we focus more on the structure than, than how old, old is the tree. I guess what I'm asking is I didn't know we had any really old growth, but I consider old growth, so I guess that's what I mean. I mean, 30 years, 50 years, 100 years. Well, yeah, so, so I think most of the, the work that we're doing, or at least the work on this topic, it's 80 years and above is where people are thinking, but that 80 years can be 100, could be 200. Uh, for merlets, again, they don't care how old the tree is. What they care about is that they have a big enough branch that they can nest on. And that's how we actually evaluate merlet habitat, is whether or not there are potential nesting platforms, not how old the tree is. So it is that structure piece. Yeah. Related question. Uh, I, just, I understand that on a by scale, there's a particular structure that makes a tree suitable for nesting or not. But has anyone looked at, uh, on the large scale, doing habitat models, species distribution models, to look at uh, generally what makes a suitable habitat for mm -hmm. Yeah, so as part of the Northwest Forest Plan, that's been a lot of the work that Marty Raphael and, uh, and others have done. And it, it came out in last year's synthesis of the Northwest Forest Plan. So you can go through and look at kind of hab habitat suitability um, at different levels from Merlitz across Oregon, um, Washington, and um, Northwestern California for that. So people have been looking at that. We've been looking at that a little bit too for some of the work that we're doing. Um, I didn't mention it because the, the field piece is such a large component, but we do have some modeling pieces that we're doing, trying to look at Merlet records, look at habitat, look at overlays with predators as well. So um, we have some folks that you might be interested in talking about with that. Would you mind repeating questions for online? Oh, sure. Yep. Yes. Are there any efforts to expand into Washington or California, or is anyone in Washington or California doing similar work? So the, the question is about who might be doing Merlet work in other states right now. Um, there are other, there are certainly efforts to, to conduct surveys within stands, but I don't think anyone else is tagging birds to look for nests, as far as I know. And that's not just in adjacent states, but that's up into Alaska as well. I think we're the only study right now. There was a big push in British Columbia a few years ago to do this. There's been projects in California, and there's a project in Washington that wrapped up maybe five years ago. So Oregon hasn't had a big project like this. We're kind of um, late in the game, but we're the only project we know of right now that's doing this. Do you have a question, Greg? I do. Um, it has to do with um, what your findings are, food habits. You mentioned that. And I would imagine if you're seeing these birds come and feed the chicks, you've got some idea on what forage fish they're actually bringing back. Yep. And a couple of questions. Specific species, are, is there, you know, and, and is it mostly one or is it a wide variety? And are there individuals that seem to focus on a given species mm -hmm. or have preferences or it looks that way? Okay, so let me let me repeat that question. So what are merlets eating? What are they feeding to their chicks? And then is there some sort of specialization by individuals in terms of a male or female brings back one type or are they kind of a generalist as an individual forager? Is that right? Sure. So uh, thank you. I always love it when people say sure because I, I know I'm close. <laughs> Uh, the answer is we can get that data, and in fact, you saw that shot of a sand lance. Mm -hmm. That is a great video. It's the ideal footage. We, we also get footage that is blurry, and we can't get it. And if you think about this, there's two trees that are moving back and forth. So it's highly variable, but that's one thing that we, we want to get information on that. What we can do in some cases is we, we're tracking where birds are in the ocean. So we can, in some cases, tie where the bird was foraging to where, what it's bringing back to the nest. We haven't done that yet, but we have the potential to do that. But it is limited by those cameras. And one camera this year, we couldn't actually see the nest. We didn't have a big tree that was adjacent. And so we, we didn't get any footage from it. So 
we would love to do that because um, what we can do with that information, as you well know, is you can say, well, if the fish is this species and it's this long, it gives you this much in terms of its energy density. And so there's variation in terms of how long the birds are on the nest. Some, some as you saw, are on the nest for four weeks. Some are on the nest for six weeks. It's a 50% increase to be about the same size in terms of your growth. So what's driving that? And it may be that you're getting low quality prey. Um, it may be that they're getting fed infrequently. Um, those are things that we want to look at. We have somewhere around 7,000 hours of footage. We've gone through about 60% of it. We've we targeted the, the provisioning rates. And I think we're, we're slated to finish that by Christmas if, if we can keep the students going. So mm -hmm. we give them all kinds of candy and coffee and things. Uh, is there any way that you can test the fecal matter on the nest after the bird is gone? We can do that. And in fact, we've been doing that to look at um, a pilot project to see if you can pick up that signature in what you might think is an old nest because all that fecal matter is there and, and of course the winter rains come and it washes away so when you're climbing up in those trees and I say you because I'm not the one doing it <laughs> when you look down our, our uh, canopy college has done this a long time so he, when he climbs trees he can say oh I think there's a platform here but we're trying to figure out if there's a way to look at the stable isotope signature and say actually there's a marine component in that piece, so we think that that was an old nest site. Um, so we are using that, and we could use it to kind of um, test that on these good nests, but um, we're taking a relatively small sample, so I'm not sure how much of that is available to go around, but that's a good idea. Yeah. So. Our nest reused. Our nest reused. That is a, um, a huge question, and we don't have the answer. We know that nest sites get revisited by birds, and there's there's evidence from the study that I cited in Washington where there was a nest in one year and the following year there was a trail camera set up and birds were with tags were at that nest. We don't know those tags weren't working so we don't know if it was which bird it was. Um, what is probably more likely is that birds are using the same stand and perhaps the same tree and they're moving around that stand and you'd expect that from a bird that's trying to be cryptic and hidden um, that you wouldn't be in the same nest site, kind of spread your eggs around so it's not in, in one area. But that's a key question is whether those nest sites are being used and also is that same pair going back to the site. We think that's the case, but we don't have, we don't have strong evidence of that. So that's kind of our, our working assumption right now. Yes? I was interested in the, uh, the breeding pair to a 24-hour alternating shift. Yeah. Does that begin with incubation? And does it continue? It's just during that incubation period. Okay, and can, so can you pick that up by seeing an individual, I mean, on your records from the ocean observations on the tags, and we see this guy every other day. Mm -hmm. So that comes, okay, so if you do that, then after, after the hatching, do you then start seeing an individual every day, and that gives you the indication that it has hatched? Okay. Yeah, no, no, that's exactly right. Yeah. You know, using that on-off pattern to determine what stage of the... Right. Sorry, I forgot to, to, to repeat that question. So I think the question is, can you use telemetry and the pattern of the bird coming and going to determine whether or not the nest was successful or not? Um, we could do that. Fortunately, we've been able to find those nests that go to the nestling stage to confirm it. The nests that fail usually do so during the incubation phase. And we're out there looking for the bird, and the bird just never shows back up. So we don't know what happened. Because it's a... a a 28, 30 day incubation period, we have a long time to do that. And so it's never taken us longer than that, where we would have to use that sort of um, on off pattern differently. Do you have a question? Do you have any um, other known predators on camera? On our camera? Yeah, so um, the question was what about the, the other causes of nest failure, including nest predators? The, the red tailed hawk is the most startling um, footage that we have. And it's the, really the only nest um, footage of a nest predator. The other nests that have failed, as I mentioned, have done so before we had a camera, or there were nests that something happened with the egg during incubation. And we don't know if it was um, an egg that had a weak spot or a crack somehow, but um, the nest failed because the, that somehow set off the incubation rhythm to the point where one bird didn't come back for a cycle, and then one bird came back and checked and then left, and then the nest was just done. So the, the, the causes for failure are not just predators. It's, it, there are other factors as well. So if something happens to one of the adults, then the nest would likely fail as well, because they need to. That would be my assumption. 
Um, we know for, for other species that if one member of the pair dies, that, that sometimes they carry on, sometimes they don't. It just depends on the individual. And, and if you can imagine if it was a, a bird that was close to fledging, it might be something that one bird could do, but if it was early on, it probably isn't enough. So it might be dependent. That was a failed nest. And in fact, um, uh, you mentioned about uh, nest predators. Uh, that nest failed. The, the chick slowly declined in terms of its health. And we don't know if that's because the, the parents stopped feeding it um, or kind of slowed down their level of feeding because of something wrong with the chick, or if the chick's demise came because parents started slowing down. I don't know if it was the, I want to say chicken or egg thing. Yeah, I know. You, you got to watch the ornithological jokes. Um, but, but we know that, that that chick never did, on the, in the big leaf maple nest, never did survive um, for, for reasons we don't know. Sometimes that happens with these, these chicks. They hatch and they just don't, they don't make it for some reason. And because we don't have a good, uh, for that nest, we didn't have a good video on it. We couldn't tell, oh, there's some sort of issue with it. We didn't see a predator come in and attack it or anything, but it could have had some sort of issue from the beginning. Yeah. So when we talk about potential nesting platforms, the, the definition is anything that's 10 meters above the ground. And I think that's based on, it's probably not based on a nest being 10 meters, but nests can be relatively low. Um, and again, it depends on the tree. If there's lots of vegetation and there's a good path, it might be a nest that's used there. Some of our nests are really high. We had one last year that was about 200 feet off the ground. So again, you can imagine trying to see that bird come and go. It's, you can't even see the top of the tree. It's, it's, it's amazing. Yes? We don't know for sure. Uh, we know that other members of the auk family, like puffins and murres, that have been tagged at a colony and watched through time, can can be relatively long-lived. So you can use an equation to say, well, if a murrelet is this big, based on the relationship between body size and longevity, um, where would a murrelet fall along that line? And it turns out to be about 15 years, but, but might be longer as well. But that's what you get, though, with these species that are long-lived and don't have a lot of, um, have kind of a single egg. They usually it's kind of the, the elephant versus the, the, the mouse um, life history. You either live long and, and just have a few individuals. Merlot seem to be on that side of things, as well as the other members of the auk family. Although some members of the auk family have multiple eggs. So Merlots are different in that regard. Yeah. Question on your cameras. How far are the cameras from the bird? You install those, and are you seeing any disturbance on those birds when you're putting those cameras up to climb the trees? No, I would say that this disturbance on. Uh, Sorry, I keep forgetting the answer. Okay, okay. Um, great. So your second question, disturbance is probably minimal. Um, again, we've we've flown a drone near a nest, and I think that would have been a lot more um, um, problematic to the birds. And, and the, all the photos that you got was from that initial climb of the tree of the, of the bird on the nest. In terms of how far we can zoom, I want to say it's probably 60 plus meters. So. Um, if you think about merlets, they're, they're usually selecting a big tree, and there's usually not a lot of big trees in the stand. So we have to find a tree that's usually at the same height or higher, or maybe upslope, um, to actually get that shot that we need. So we need a we need a zoom that's pretty sufficient. Yeah. Let's get one more question, and then we'll. Why do uh, your, your merlets have a low rate of return to the nest throughout all the year? Why do they have a low rate of return? Well, I think it probably goes back to um, merlets are trying to hide their nests from predators, and they, they, in theory, are trying to spread the risk around. And so in, if they don't come back to the same nest site, um, there's less. If, if you have a predator that's learning the activity patterns of a bird, and you know that this is always a tree that has lots of activity, you'd be more likely to, to investigate that tree. So if you are a merlet, you might be better off putting that nest in different locations each year. Um, that said, we do we have gone back to the, the nests that we found in 2018, and we have found activity in those stands. So that suggests that the birds are there. They're just not at that individual nest site. And a lot of these, tr a lot of these trees that have nest platforms have loads and loads of them. So they're, might, they're probably not limited by nest platforms. They're probably more limited by trees in those stands. 